Uh, our next speaker is uh, Brian English, and his uh, work on urban poverty has been uh, shared by the New York Times, uh, as well as some other notable publications. And he's actually the uh, in country director for CHF International in India, if I remember correctly. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. So I wish this slide was from my opening joke, but unfortunately it's not. And there are indeed a billion people living in slums today, most of them in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. But I want to remind everyone that slums are not the inevitable result of urbanization. They're the, the products of failing government institutions, dysfunctional land markets, uh, lack of political will, and most of all, which is what I want to emphasize, policies and practices of exclusion. By the year 2030, the number of people living in slums is set to double to two billion people. The core of, of all solutions must stop planning for the poor, and we need to start planning with them. Otherwise, we're only going to marginalize them. For the past two and a half years, I've been living in India as the director of CHF International, helping slum communities and local governments in three cities create more inclusive planning processes with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So with my time tonight, I'd like to tell you quickly one method we've used by moving beyond Google Maps and helping some residents and governments explore the conditions of their communities and then empower them to take action. We partnered with the city government of Pune near Mumbai to essentially flip the traditional top-down planning mode and rather than simply extract data on slum conditions and let policymakers mull over and think about what they would do, we gave the data back to the slum residents and taught them how to take action. So our first step was to map, physically map all the slums in the city, about 500 of them scattered throughout the city. And we did this with satellite imagery and GPS tools on the ground. Uh, and then th there were small slums of 100 households and large slums of 9,000 households around the city. And we defined each map down to the household footprint level. And then we marked out uh, adjacent households of 25 houses. And this is where it gets interesting. We asked volunteers from the slums to uh, conduct surveys of their neighbors. We asked each, each uh, volunteer to survey 25 of their neighbors. And we had over a thousand volunteers sign up to help us with this survey. In total, they collected information on the social, economic, and living conditions of almost half a million people. That's almost equal to the entire DC population. After we aggregated all the survey, we were able to help the city see new patterns in slums across the city. For example, we learned that 80% of households in one slum used open space for toilets. And in another, 65% of the families visited health clinics once a month. We could see where clusters of households still relied on community water taps and which households experienced drainage backups during storms. Then we gave the survey results back to the volunteers. We taught them how to organize neighborhood meetings and talk about the common issues that the data revealed. We call this process micro-planning, but it's, at its core, I call it empowerment. In, the two, in two years, we helped 130 communities undertake this process, which were home to almost a quarter million people. We taught them how to seek consensus and prioritize which issues they're gonna address first, how to mobilize their own resources, and which doors of the government they should knock on. Of the 130 communities we worked with, almost all of them mobilized resources of the government and of their own to execute tangible products and projects that improve the lives of their communities. And the results were amazing. Drainage pipelines were constructed. Systems to manage household garbage were organized. Classes for teenage mothers were instituted. A community center was constructed. One group of women, when they found out all their, their husbands were getting drunk, they formed a pressure group and they went and shut down the local liquor store. <laughs> uh, another group, when they found out they all had domestic violence issues, they went and got a police station constructed. And they even got it banned with a police officer. Another group constructed a vegetable market so they didn't have to stand on the side of the road near speeding traffic and sell vegetables anymore. We published this micro-planning method in a format that the communities and government can use and keep replicating in the future. Because our work is not done, and we're continuing to solicit funding and support to do this around the world. The results of our surveys have been published in what we call slum atlases, and we make this available to government and non-governmental organizations. And we've done this in three cities in India and two in Ghana. And 
This effort earned us a feature story in Scientific America titled Share the Wealth. And in my opinion, until we start really sharing the wealth, it'll be a, a difficult and close to impossible to imagine a world without slums. Thank you.